programs. I'm just also a university professor for sustainability science and policy. Sherry Abbott. So he's also one of our own. So Syracuse University claims him as a graduate, of, as a, having received his bachelor's here, and also a, a master's from the in public administration from the Maxwell School. So we're grateful for that. Um, and uh, I just he's he's going to talk about his book *Food Foolish*, which I actually read on a long plane ride over the weekend. Uh, a really interesting intersection about food waste and. Uh, climate change, sustainability, and, and food systems, and I'm really excited to hear whether or not Maltus is right. <laughs> Sherry, thank you very much. Thank you for the really kind introduction. It's great to be back in Syracuse. It's great to be at the Center of Excellence. Um, Syracuse is so much like home for me, as uh, Sherry had mentioned. Uh, graduate of Syracuse University, both my wife and I, my wife's in the back, uh, undergraduate at Syracuse, I stayed and uh, did my master's. Uh, we're doing our own part in our family, so we have the next generation attending Syracuse University, and my niece was with me, she's a freshman this year in the College of Arts and Sciences, so we're starting to create our own legacy, and we're really, really proud of that. Um, Syracuse does feel like home. Um, not only did I attend uh, college here, but uh, my first job was with the Syracuse Chamber of Commerce um, and got great experience there and got to know and love this community really, really well. Um, and then I moved over to Carrier and United Technologies. Um, and 23 years later, I'm here, still with Carrier and United Technologies, talking to you about something that we feel very passionately about, uh, which is the future of our food. And before I go on, I want to recognize a colleague, John Shaw. John, are you, there he is in the back. John has been a great collaborator with me on this issue, providing a lot of early inspiration and thought. Um, and we uh, really thank him for the work that he's done on the food issue. So um, thank you, John. So food and United Technologies, it may not come intuitively um, to everybody. Um, as Sherry had mentioned, United Technologies is a uh, Fortune 45 company. Uh, we make uh, jet engines, we make aerospace components, uh, we make elevators, we make fire and security systems, uh, and we make heating uh, air and air conditioning systems. Uh, but the last piece of what we make, we're not so well known for, but is equally important as everything else, which is refrigeration technologies. And in fact, our refrigeration technologies keep more food fresh in transit and at retail settings than anybody else in the world. Many of those technologies have been developed and continue to be developed right here 
at our research and development center on Carrier Circle in Syracuse. So we make marine container refrigeration systems that move the world's food supply on the ocean. We do that more than anybody else. We make truck trailer refrigeration systems that move food on our highways from point A to point B, and we do that more than anybody else. And we make supermarket refrigeration systems, which keep food fresh at retail more than anybody else. It is that long history of food that is actually forcing us to think differently about the future of food. What are the trends that we're facing? And how are we going to feed a growing planet? When I talk about these issues, I like to start with the big picture perspective. And this is one of my favorite images. It's the Earth at night. It tells us a lot. It certainly tells us that light is a good indicator of development. And we're sitting on a pretty bright spot on the map today. But what's interesting to me about this image is we know people are home elsewhere, but the lights aren't on yet. We have to consider the environmental implications, the energy implications, the food implications when the lights do come on. So just think about for a moment China, which is over here. Every year in China, 15 million people move from the country to the city. 15 million people. And the Chinese government tells us that trend will continue for the next 20 years. And you can see the implications. It's mostly a migration pattern like this, and the coast of China is becoming quite bright. So over the next 20 years, 300 million people in China are going to move to cities. That's like the entire population of the United States. That's fundamentally going to change cities. It's fundamentally going to change the way that we think about food. And what's driving this are two trends of our time that are like the ocean's tide. You can't stop them. First is population growth, and the other is urbanization. So from a population standpoint, today we live on a planet of 7 billion people. And just a little bit over half of us live in an urban or city setting. In just 35 years, we're going to grow our population 35% to 9.6 billion people. And two-thirds of all those people are going to live in cities. We're going to have people that are moving farther and farther and farther away from their food sources as they migrate into urban centers. Our system of food and food delivery is going to dramatically change. Population growth is certainly going to demand the need for new cities and new buildings. Those buildings have to be better. That's what this building is all about, the center of excellence, and why we have been so pleased to support the mission of the Center of Excellence here. We just concluded some very, very exciting, groundbreaking research with Harvard and the COE and Upstate New York Medical Center on the health and productivity impact of green buildings. I hope I'm invited back to talk to you about that. That's not my talk today. But we focus on buildings and we focus on food. Urbanization is going to mean we're going to have to think about food fundamentally in a different way. And to do this, we need better data, whether it's green buildings or food. We know data drives decisions. Better data is going to lead to better decisions. That's why we are committed to advancing the state of the art from a research perspective on this issue. And that's why we wrote Food Foolish, to raise the level of dialogue, to connect the global dialogue, and to raise the, the, uh, the enormous issues and consequences and the hidden connection of food waste to hunger and climate change. Now, I can tell you, starving people, greenhouse gas emissions, water scarcity, national insecurity are anything but foolish topics. But the way we systematically and mostly unintentionally waste our food in the face of those challenges is perhaps humankind's most foolish practice. So any discussion about food starts with a discussion about farming. And we live, you live, I used to live, this community has benefited from some of the most beautiful and fertile land on the globe. Farming is the largest human endeavor on earth. We literally move more land. We literally alter the face of our planet more through farming than we do anything else. And it looks like this. We use 38% of our ice-free land to farm. 
You know, if you take all the cities in the world and you put them together, they use just 2% of our land. Cities use 2%. Farming uses 38% of our land. So we use a lot of land. And I'm going to show you we use a lot of resources to make our food. And the ugly, ugly, ugly truth is, after all of that, we throw away 40% of our food. 40% of our food never makes it from our farm to our fork. It happens for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different places, and we're going to explore that today. But it's hard to imagine a more inefficient system. Can you think of in society any place where we would tolerate 40% inefficiency, knowingly and willfully, day after day after day, except for in this case, it's for the single resource we need to sustain the human race. We write about it in our book. You can think about it this way. You go to the grocery store, you buy three bags of groceries. Before you get to your car, dump half in the parking lot. When you get home, immediately throw the other half into your garbage. You buy three, you get two. Welcome to our world food system. It creates a mountain of waste. It actually generates 1.3 billion metric tons of waste. In the United States, food is the second largest item in our solid landfills, solid waste landfills. In some places like Hong Kong, it's the number one item. Food. So, an elephant weighs one metric ton. Think of 1.3 billion happy, healthy elephants standing on top of each other. That's the mountain of food waste we create every year on our planet. So I think it would be helpful to understand what are the food waste types and how does it happen. So this is UN data. The number one item uh, in, food, in the food system that we waste is cereals, excluding beer, by the way. <laughs> according to the United Nations. But look at the next five categories. Vegetables, fruits, excluding wine, and I can personally attest that we waste no wine, milk and eggs, meat, fish, and seafood. These five categories represent greater than 50% of all the food that's wasted, and they all have one thing in common. We can extend the life of that food. We can save that food through simple, common refrigeration techniques. It has been proven to be the most effective way to save our food. We've been trying to find ways to preserve our food since cavemen, right? We advanced a little bit beyond that. We've brined food, we've salted food, we've put it in, in root cellars, and all of those have those place, their place. But the most effective way to maintain our food, as we know it today, is through common refrigeration. And we need to save our food because we live on a hungry planet. Tonight, one in nine people will go to bed hungry. One in nine. That's 805 million people. That's the equivalent population of the entire United States and the entire European Union that will go to bed hungry. Chronically malnourished, don't get enough food. Think about this. We grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. We live on a planet of 7 billion people. Only six are getting enough food. That's the inefficiency in the system. That's the penalty we're paying through food waste. We grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. We grow enough food to feed everybody who wants it today and the 9.6 that are coming, the 9.6 billion that will join us in 35 years. Let's look at hunger by the numbers. So on the right is the 805 or on your left, is the 805 million people who go to bed hungry every night. On the right is an equally tragic number. There are more than 100 million children under the age of five who are underweight. And in the middle is a new concept, at least for me, that we've started to explore in the book, which is the consequences of hidden hunger. So about a billion on the left don't get enough food, but two billion aren't getting the right food. So these are people who aren't getting the right nutrients and vitamins so they can live their lives to the fullest. And what we've learned is we can actually put a price on that. And through our research in the book, we found that hidden hunger can cost an economy about 1% of its GDP. 
So what does that look like? We decided to look at what this would mean for India. And why India? Well, in India, research shows that India loses as much as 50% of all of its fruits and vegetables. 50%, higher than any place else. Well, 20% of India's GDP is $20 billion. That's the deficit their economy is in because of hidden hunger. And we asked, okay, what else is worth $20 billion in the Indian economy? And in a world of ironies, India's entire food welfare plan is $20 billion. So we can put a price on hidden hunger, but we can also put a larger price on the food waste issue itself. And the United Nations is just starting to do this. They have a full cost accounting model that they've done of the cost of food waste. And they estimate every year it's $2.6 trillion which is the equivalent GDP of the entire country of France. Now they measure it in three ways, and we're going to look at it. They measure it, the economic cost, the social cost, and the environmental cost. So if we look at the economic cost, the retail value of the food that we throw away is $936 billion. This is food that's a resource. This is food that you otherwise have sold. $936 billion. And then what's worse, $100 billion goes for the subsidies that we paid to the farmers to grow the food that we then threw away. If you take the full economic cost of it, it's a trillion dollars. So one trillion out of the 2.6. Then let's look at the social costs, almost $900 billion. So the UN has taken a look at, okay, what does food waste cost us from a health standpoint, a livelihood loss, or conflict? The number one category here, $400 billion, is in conflict. This recognizes the fact that we are overcompensating for the system. We're using more land and more soil than we need to. We're using more water than we need to. It's creating border conflicts. It's creating conflict, and they price it at $400 billion. So economic price, value of food, $1 trillion. Social costs, $900 billion. And the balance is the environmental cost at nearly $700 billion. This is the cost of food waste when you break it down from a biodiversity standpoint, water scarcity, or the greenhouse gas emissions. This is the fully loaded carbon price of the carbon that's in the food waste. This is what it costs. We're going to look at carbon a little bit more in depth. $2.6 trillion in total. Now, where do we waste our food? This was an eye-opener for me, too. About one-third of all the food that we waste happens at the consumer level. That's where we buy too much and we throw it away. It happens all the time, unintentionally, but it does. Or we're served too much in a restaurant, we can't finish the meal, we don't bring it home. That's the consumer level. This is usually a rich country dilemma where we have enough resources to do that. But two-thirds of all the food that we waste happens at the production and distribution level. This is where the food doesn't make it out of the field for harvest. It's where it rots in poor transportation networks. It's where it rots in open air markets. And that's predominantly a developing country issue, two thirds. Altogether, it has a big environmental footprint. Let's look at carbon again. If you take all the energy, all the carbon we put into the food that we then throw away, it equals 3.3 billion metric tons. So this is fuel for tractors, electricity for water pumps, uh, power for food packaging stations. Think about all the energy, all the carbon we need to make our food. And then you take the part that we throw away, the 40%, it equals 3.3 billion metric tons. So if you measured food waste as a country, it would be the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind China and the United States. But when was the last time you heard anybody mention the words food waste in a climate policy debate? That's why we wrote this book, to try to raise a level of awareness and connect the global dialogue on what is hidden, but now we know. Carbon is one thing, but we have to think about water. So, just bear with me for a minute. You can close your eyes. Think about the iconic image of the Earth from space. What do you see? 
If you close your eyes, you can open it, you see blue, right? Because 71% of our planet is covered by the ocean. But we only get 2% of our food from the ocean. So the ocean, and a healthy ocean, is going to be an important piece of how we're going to feed more people while we save food at the same time. But here's the perverse carbon cycle at work. Over the last 200 years, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere has been driving up the level of CO2 in the ocean. So we get CO2 in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel sources for buildings or to make our food. We already know there's 3.3 billion metric tons of CO2 in the way we make the food that we throw away. So when we do that, we burn fossil fuels, CO2 goes into the air. But guess what? 50% of it gets absorbed by the ocean. It doesn't just stay in the air. It stays in the air and creates a greenhouse gas effect that we all hear about. But 50% of our CO2 gets absorbed by the ocean. And over the last 200 years, that level of rising carbon in the oceans has increased the acidification in our oceans by 26%. And that level of acidity is killing off the basic building blocks of life in the ocean. The plankton, the small shrimp, small shrimp are eaten by the bigger, the, the small fish who are eaten by the bigger fish that we want to catch so that we can eat. So the more that we put carbon into the atmosphere through food waste and other sources, the more that we are polluting the one source that we can go to as a source to feed our hungry and growing population going forward. And while we're talking about water, let's talk about fresh water. Let's talk about the water that we can drink. So of all the water on the planet, just 1.3% is fresh water. And we know that's in the lakes, it's in the rivers, it's in streams. 1.3% of all of our water is fresh water. We use 70% of that to grow our food. So this can be intuitive. If you've ever tried to grow a tomato in a pot or in a garden, you know you've got to put a lot of water into that plant to get it to bear fruit. So we use 70% of all of our fresh water to grow our food. And here, I think, is one of the more shocking findings in my research for the book. The water we use to grow the food that we throw away is greater than the water used by any nation on the planet. The water we use to grow the food we throw away is more than any country on the map uses by itself. You can measure it at the global level. You can measure it at the national level. You can even measure it at the individual level. So I've done this. I'm sure many of you might have too. You buy a head of broccoli, and you put it in the back of your refrigerator, and you forget about it. A couple weeks later, it turns yellow, it turns brown, you can't use it anymore, you throw it away. Unintentional, but you do. You throw it away, I throw it away. Well, we know, we've learned there's a carbon impact to that, but every time we throw away the head of broccoli, we flushed away 5.4 gallons of fresh water that it took to grow the head of broccoli in the first place. So what needs to change? Obviously, a lot of things need to change. And to address a massive issue like our 40% food waste, we're going to need a everything above strategy. No one thing is going to solve this problem. But one area that we have on the shelf today is technology that can deal with this. Technology to ensure the refrigeration of our food supply is maintained in a manner that we can save the food and we can actually extend the food to feed more people. It's common sense. You would know this. We all know this, that if you leave fresh vegetables out in the sun at 86 degrees, they're going to last less than two days. If you think about a more precious commodity like fish, fish will last less than two hours at 86 degrees. Yet with simple refrigeration, fish can lash up, last up to two weeks. But fresh vegetables will last less than two days at 86 degrees. Guess what? This is when we grow our food, is when it's 86 degrees out. And in India, where this problem is especially pronounced, 86 degrees would be a cool day in the summer. 
Now, I can see exactly what you're thinking. Okay, this guy's from Carrier. He wants to sell more truck trailer refrigeration systems, which are going to create carbon on the road. We're going to put more trucks on the road using more energy. And have you really done anything to save the environment? We asked the same question to the consulting firm of Deloitte. Deloitte has done all the number crunching for the UN for its food waste footprint data. So they hold the data. And we went to Deloitte and we said, if the emerging economies had the same level of refrigeration as the developed world, could we actually, on a mass balance, on a net basis, save greenhouse gas emissions by growing the cold chain? those refrigeration technologies? And the answer is yes, absolutely yes, in two ways. First, if you just look at the absolute carbon, the carbon you would need to grow the refrigeration technologies in the emerging economies is 10 times less than the carbon saved that those technologies would save from avoiding food waste. That's the first piece of data. Second piece of data is, OK, how much actual greenhouse gases can you save? Well, you remember the early pie chart, refrigeration won't take care of everything, but it can take care of a good chunk. If you take that chunk out and you say, how much of those can we save on a greenhouse gas basis, net basis, it's greater than 50%. So technology can be one of the answers here. And we did a little bit of a case study on this with India in the book. So India produces 28% of the world's bananas. Yet it only exports 0.3%. That's because of the tremendous loss from food waste in the system. So if India was able to have the same level of technology that the rest of the world has from a refrigeration standpoint, they could grow their cargo exports of bananas from 3,000 cargo containers to 190 cargo containers, providing 95,000 more jobs supporting 34,000 smallhold farmers. Food can be a resource. Food can be an ability not only to feed ourselves, but if we can save more food, it be can become a resource to countries for their trade. And how do we do it? This is how we do it. The United Nations has a goal to create a $100 billion climate mitigation fund by 2020. They already have $20 billion, I mean, sorry, $10 billion right now. So this fund will be created to help developing countries mitigate climate change, do something about climate change. And if they get to their goal of $100 billion by 2020, it's not unrealistic to think, for example, if you're the prime minister of India, you're going to get $25 billion to do something about climate change. So what would you do? Well, you would change out your power plants. You would adopt lower emission vehicles. Uh, you'd build more green buildings. All those we need. They're all very important. But why wouldn't avoiding food waste be on the list? It's the only climate policy that saves greenhouse gas emissions, saves water, feeds more people, and promotes national security. We also wrote the book because the dialogue on this issue is fragmented. It's in silos. The hunger organizations aren't talking to the government organizations, who aren't talking to the technology providers, who aren't talking to the academic world. I found this time in and time out. The book serves as a catalyst for us to raise a level of dialogue that to connect the issues, to get all the data on the table in one place in hopefully an interesting and compelling way. That's why we wrote Food Foolish. I want to conclude today with just four quick vignettes on my personal takeaway in uh, my experience in writing the book and the stories and the people that we met. First is with Catherine Bertini, Syracuse's own. She's a professor at the Maxwell School. Catherine also had a long and distinguished career with the United Nations, including running the UN World Food Program. She knows a lot about food. 
So we were excited to interview Catherine for the book. And we asked her a question. We said, if you had all the power in the world and you had a magic wand and you could solve hunger, what's the one thing you would do? And her answer was not what I expected. Her answer was, I would spend every bit of my money in political world will to make sure that every girl was educated. And her perspective was the more that we educate our girls, which we take for granted in our country, but in many other countries, uh, it, it's not taken for granted. The more that we educate our girls, the more they bring resources back to the family. The more they bring resources back to the family, the more we have something to do about hunger. So I learned a lot from Catherine Bertini. I spent an afternoon at the Turek Farms in Cayuga County, uh, just north of um, just north of Ithaca, and I learned a lot. That's uh, Frank Turek uh, on the left. Uh, there's me, Jason Turek on the right, and that's my co-author uh, Eric Schultz. And I learned three things from the Tureks. Um, first is, within an hour of harvesting anything, they immediately put it into refrigeration. And I'm in this business, and that even shocked me. 100%. They grow corn. They're a, they are a top 10 producer of sweet corn, the corn that we can all eat. Top 10 producer of sweet corn in our country. They grow corn, squash, cabbage, and pumpkins. 100% within one hour go into some type of refrigeration to maintain the quality and integrity of the food so that when it arrives at Wegmans, it arrives at Whole Foods, it's the best that it can be. That was learning number one. Learning number two is just the incredible challenge that farmers have. So this is a big operation. They take all of their capital and they literally put it into the ground. And then they hope that it rains. And then they hope that something grows. And then they hope it will produce fruits and vegetables. And then they hope somebody will buy it. Because when they put all their capital into the ground, they have no idea if they have any buyers. They operate on a 10, 14, 20-day buying agreement with retailers. That's how much at risk our food system is. And he showed me a beautiful picture of a bright orange farm, pumpkin farm. It was beautiful. You could see pumpkins as far as your eye could go in this picture. And I said, yes, those pumpkins are great. He said, I know. It was a, it was a bumper crop. We had never had many more pumpkins as this year because all the elements worked together. We had beautiful pumpkins. The year was 2001. They all sat in the field. 9-11 happened. And as you can imagine, people didn't feel that great about celebrating Halloween and carving jack-o'-lanterns. They all stayed in the field. He lost all that money. That's the fragility of our system, of our farming system. But the third thing I learned from the Turks was, I think, the most eye-opening. And that's food waste starts at the planting level. So they plant rows and rows and miles and miles of corn. You can imagine they're a top 10 producer of sweet corn. And their goal is to get the seed planted at one inch depth uniformly across these rows. Now, if the land was as flat as this floor, you might get close to it. But as you know, farmland is like this. So trying to get uniform one-inch depth actually takes a lot of technology. They use laser technology and other things to try to get the seed at one-inch depth. I said, well, what's so important about that? Well, they have a limited labor supply. Corn is still harvested by hand. You have to send pickers into the field to pick the corn. He said, if I plant all my corn at one inch depth, I know that in 10 weeks or so, it'll bloom, the corn will be ready on the stalk, and I'll send my labor in to pick it. He goes, as I'm planting it, if it's planted at a half inch depth, the corn is going to bloom in eight weeks, and it will rot before my labor gets to the field. If my machine goes wrong and I plant it at an inch and a half, the corn is going to bloom in 12 weeks, and my labor will have left the field, and the corn will rot on the stalk. Food waste can start at that fundamental level in an issue that we have to think about holistically. 
learned a lot from the University of Nottingham, where we sponsored some research, and from Cornell University, where I spent a great day with ag professors uh, at Cornell. And what I learned from here is that when we're talking about issues of hunger, it's not about quantity of food. It's about quality of food. It's that whole hidden hunger issue that we talked about earlier. That it's not just enough to get enough food on people's plates. You have to get the right food. And usually the right food with the highest nutrients and vitamins comes from our vegetables and our fruits, which are the most delicate in the system and the ones that we're wasting greater than others. And then my own personal experience. This is a picture from my phone. And it's actually an image from the back of the book. So I toured the Hong Kong food and vegetable distribution uh, warehouse. This is a massive operation. So Hong Kong is one of the world's largest ports. So they have all this food that comes from the ocean, gets to the port. Within an hour, it arrives at the distribution center where they break it down from the boxes into smaller boxes and then they distribute the food to wholesalers and retailers and grocery stores. And in the middle of the market, I find this heap of food waste. And it was just a good reminder that this issue is everywhere, that we see food waste everywhere. And because we see it everywhere, we can make a different connection to this issue than I found we can make with others. Everybody has a connection to food. Everybody understands that we waste food because we all see it in our own way at different times, mostly unintentionally, but we see it. But this is an issue where we can connect to everybody universally. I can do it at my dinner table with my kids who constantly rip me not to be food foolish about what I'm doing. Uh, but I can connect all the way from that dinner table to the United States State Department where I've met with U.S. climate negotiators who have been seasoned and involved in climate issues for more than 20 years, who said to me, John, I had no idea that food waste was a climate issue. Because it's so bifurcated in our society. In the United States, who owns food from a regulatory standpoint? Everybody. The FDA, the Department of Agriculture, the EPA. Nobody is looking at this, though, from the environmental impact and what we can do. The United States is just starting to turn the tide here. And if you uh, read the announcement last week, the U.S. just declared its first food waste reduction goal ever, which is to reduce our food waste by 50% by 2030. I commend the administration and the government for starting this. It has to start with a big goal that we can all work towards, and now we all have to do our part. But I have a lot of hope uh, from writing the book. I have a lot of hope that um, we can solve this issue at the global level, at the national level, and even at the individual level with actions we can take. If you're interested in learning more, I invite you to follow our social media channels where we're going to continue to publish research not only on the food issue, but on the buildings issue and the green buildings issue I mentioned before. I'm really thrilled and honored to have had the time to spend a little bit with you today on this issue, and I will look forward to any of your dialogue or questions. Thank you. Yeah, there's a growing um, there's a growing uh, 
uh, interest, believe it or not, and actually practice that we can get uh, protein from insects more sustainably than we can get protein from other sources. And so um, you can buy cricket bars, um, which are uh, made from uh, bugs. You know, in some societies, eating bugs is, is, is a common practice. And by the way, it was by our ancestors, too. Uh, before we found other ways to do it. So yeah, there's a there's a growing awareness to this trend that um, that uh, there are proteins and other sources that we might think about if we're willing to be adventurous with an open mind. So we have opened the floor to questions. Um, I think that um, one way that this is interest by both a lot more environmentally friendly interest climate change more effectively is to introduce um, electric vehicles and solar power or wind power into that mix to become fossil fuels. Um, I think that I think that is absolutely true. Everything that you say about food waste, but I think that could give me a lot more of an impact if we combine that effort to reduce food waste with an effort to stop burning fossil fuels. There's no question about that. Thank you for bringing it up. I didn't want to go too much into a commercial for my company, but there's no there's no question that um, if we're going to view the cold chain as we call it, which is this uninterrupted uh, ability to maintain the freshness of our food at each step from farm to retail. If we're going to think about the cold chain as an enabling device to save greenhouse gas emissions from food waste, it has to be the greenest cold chain that we can think of in the first place. And so we're actually doing advanced um, research and development here at our labs in Syracuse on this. So one example is uh, we were the first in the world to um, introduce marine container refrigeration systems using a natural refrigerant. So the typical refrigerant is a chemical refrigerant, which has, if it's released into the atmosphere, has a high global warming potential. Uh, what we found through the genius of our engineers is that you can actually, ironically, use CO2 as a refrigerant. So CO2 is the world's number one greenhouse gas. But if you operate it under high pressure, it's very good at making things very cold. And so it's not great for making a room temperate like we would want it here and here in this room because you need about three times as much, much energy to get to this temperature point. But if you want to get down to lower temperature points, you can do it efficiently. That's exactly where we want our food. So we uh, uh, last year uh, introduced a product we call Natural Line, which is the world's first marine container refrigeration system using CO2 as a technology. That's the technology we developed right here in this town. And we can reduce the carbon footprint a marine container refrigeration by 28% doing that. We got a lot farther we want to go. Solar is the next horizon. How could we power our uh, marine container or truck trailer systems uh, with auxiliary power over solar or total by, by solar? We haven't um, cracked that yet. We can't find the capacity yet. Uh, enough solar energy to power what we need. Um, but I have great faith in our technologists, and I hope that we can get there soon. Yeah, that's part of the 37%. So the question was, what happens to the fruits and vegetables that are imperfect? Um, we have this romantic notion about our food. I mean, if you go into any retailer, and I won't name them, but I can't blame them. If you go into any food retailer anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, every apple is perfectly round. Every pear is perfectly shaped. Every orange is perfectly shaped. And guess what? Nature doesn't produce that uniformly 100% of the time. What happens to the apple that's perfectly fine but is oval in shape and not round in shape? It gets thrown away. It gets thrown away. So there's this great movement about ugly fruits and vegetables. Uh, I follow them on Twitter. They, they, every day they tweet out, the ugliest fruit and vegetable that they can find. But these are fruits that are deformed by nature, but perfectly fine from a quality standpoint, perfectly fine from a nutrition standpoint. And actually, there are campaigns in the UK 
uh, where um, you know there's big promotions to buy the ugly fruits and vegetables and do something with them. Um, so yes, that's part of the two thirds. I'm sorry, that's part of the one third problem where we see um, food waste at the consumer level. So you talked uh, about the so exploring this connection between the food waste and uh, climate change. You talked about the carbon that is used to produce food. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering um, how much like you thought or researched about um, the greenhouse gas emissions after the food is thrown away, and like the methane that is released in landfills, and how much of an impact um, like alternative ways of uh, so like composting, basically, right? Like industrial composting and maybe compost pickup would make an impact on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the carbon footprint of food waste um, embodies all the energy that you need to make the food, all the energy you need to distribute the food, and then if you don't use the food and it lands, ends up in a landfill, it creates methane, which is another powerful greenhouse gas. It's not as easy to break down the numbers as you think because I was trying to do it for this lecture, but it, you can get close to it in that the methane component in food waste is the minority component. The majority is everything else you need to make the food. But the question is, it's still, it's still part of the pie. So what do you do about the methane? Well, hopefully you don't waste food in the first place. So let's, but we're not going to save 100% of our food. So some of it is going to get wasted for one reason or another. So there are better sources than just sticking it in the landfill where it will decompose and create methane more than most other things in the landfill because it has the organic material and food is a growing source in landfills. We've done so well recycling that all the other traditional things that you think about in solid waste have come out of the landfills. We haven't done anything about food. So proportionally, food is becoming a more and more significant piece of what's going into the landfills. So what do you do with it? Composting is one thing. There's new technology with uh, anaerobic digesters where you can actually take food waste and basically convert it to energy. Um, so there are those types of things that, that um, can be done and we have to find a way to systematically do those better, uh, recognizing that as much as we want, we're not going to be able to avoid 100% of the food waste. John, I think you have a best answer about the energy piece of all that. There's one is the decomposition of the food is returning to the environment for this particular purpose. So I think it's a point of zero sum game with the energy, which comes from fossil fuels or the source of energy. Yeah, but the conversion of methane is counted. Yeah, but, but where does the methane came from? It's carbon that mm -hmm. from the atmosphere. You follow me on all my talks and correct me. <laughs> <laughs> Avery listened to me at PAF 101 <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> Came back for more. So you mentioned that the voice actually um, got an actual accounting cost mm -hmm. of the total price as well as there have been funds allocated for the purposes of mitigating the issue. So you also mentioned that we will technology businesses or whatever don't seem to across the board. I was curious if the UN is considering supplying these costs and or potential incentives to actual businesses um, so that they will act accordingly and the competitive market forces will help them to massively mitigate the problems that they face. Yeah, so you know, my hope is that climate change, I mean, f avoiding food waste will be identified on the menu pardon the pun, to mitigate climate change. And if we can do that, and we're making strides with the UN to connect those dots, that it's not just a water issue, it's not just an agriculture issue, but it's a big greenhouse gas issue. We're starting to make strides. If we're successful doing that, it will unlock policy resources to do something about this issue, and it will unlock funding resources, funds that countries could apply for to use however they think they could best avoid food waste in their country, whether it's through farmers or technology or communities, however they want to do it. But this could be the one way that we actually get significant funding to do something about hunger, ironically, through the climate debate, because otherwise it's not going to happen. And so the example I used before, 
you know, if you're in India, you could think of a, a lot of different ways that you could avoid food waste. You could do um, community uh, refrigerated warehouse centers where you base it in your agricultural districts where if you have a bumper crop, you're able to take it somewhere as a farmer and let it uh, be preserved as you disperse it to retailers. I met a guy who's trying to build an Uber app for refrigerated trucks in India. Think about it. I'm a farmer. I got a lot of tomatoes. I need to get them to market. Right now, my only option is to uh, drive them in the back of an open pickup truck 100 miles in 100 degree heat, and I know I'm going to lose 50%. Is there a way that I can inexpensively access technology on demand that will take my tomatoes to market? Um, so I think technology has a role to play here, not only in the refrigeration technology, but in the technology of how we match supply and demand to get a different way to think about how we can save our food. Does eating out produce more food waste? Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I didn't see that in the research. I can only hazard a guess. And my guess is we eat more food at home. At least my family does. So we don't go out, out as much. Yeah, but I, I would guess that it's it's equal, if not more, at home. I mean, where do people eat the most? They eat at home. And are you a, is anybody a hundred percent efficient in the food that comes out of your refrigerator or out of your out of your pantry? I think that um, restaurants are small businesses, and they're more efficient than you think. I, my guess is they're more efficient than we are at the way that they procure and use their food, uh, because they're actually throwing away their livelihood if they throw it away. Right. We have. Um, we addressed GMO foods um, in the book, which is a, a hot, hot topic. We've been genetically modifying foods since we've been gardening. Uh, we've cross-pollinated plants and seeds since the early farming, right? So that's at one extreme. And at the other extreme is kind of the Franken food, the we're going to have cloned animals. That's another extreme. I think somewhere in the middle is the answer. There's no doubt that um, we've been able uh, over decades to be able to produce better wheats and grains that withstand droughts. We've been able to produce uh, better forms of same grains or vegetables that withstand uh, pests. Um, so I think there's a role, there's a question of, you know, where is the equilibrium? It is. Actually, um, about 50% of the food that's grown is actually grown for people. The other 50% is used to feed animals that we eventually eat. Um, and then, you know, a significant portion goes into other products such as ethanol and other things. So, yes, it, this accounts for, for all of that. Losses at all. Right. So in the book, you talk a little bit about um, as an economy grows, people's uh, diets get better. Can you, can you expand upon that a little bit more? Sure. So, um, you know, the poorer countries um, don't have resources to buy a lot of food that, are, that have uh, higher contents of proteins because they're more expensive. So you have rice-based diets, wheat-based diets, but you can see in any economy or any society as it advances, food preferences 
change and you move out of the um, the wheats and the grains and the rice up to the fruits and vegetables and then up to the high protein level which could be um, beef or pork or chicken um, and those all have different environmental consequences as you go along the road so we explore that and what's the relative uh, value turns out fish we talked about only two percent of the food uh, in the, the ocean only you know, produces two percent two percent of the food fish is almost a hundred percent protein efficient so whatever you feed the fish you get back in in food you can eat um, it's much less for chicken worse for pork worse for beef but we're trying not to make a judgment value about it it's just understand what it is um, and understand that um, there's an implication to it. As societies grow, um, they move to these higher protein diets, which has an implication for the environment. A big implication on water, too. Most of the connection I've heard about uh, food in relation to climate change is the um, food insecurity due to droughts um, that would be affected by climate change or uh, you know, um, more wealth of crops because of added rain or um, more temperate climates. Uh, do you have any idea about how climate change will impact the waste? Um, are you likely, because of the shifts, are you likely to see more waste? Is that explored at all in the book? Uh, we did not explore it in the book, which, I mean, you can just think about it. We just went through one of the warmest summers on record. Um, we food rots at higher temperatures. So if we're going to live in a world where temperatures are rising, that can't be good for our food supply. Um, whether it's the actual rotting of the food or the changes in uh, food disease or pesticide or, or pests that, that affect our food. Uh, but there's a whole other area that needs to be explored, which is what is the impact of a warmer world on our food. We have not. I haven't seen the data on the actual um, the actual implication of that. It's smaller in comparison to all of this. Uh, it's a smaller piece of the pie, but I think it's it's equally important. Um, so, if we're talking about climate change, um, you know, feeding hungry people a good result, what are your thoughts on um, animal agriculture? And Increasing our demand for meat, so much of the food that we produce in the water that we need to go to. You know, I don't, I don't have a, an opinion on that. Uh, what I know is that we grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. Whether when I say grow, I mean plants and animals. Like animals grow too. We we grow and produce enough food to feed 10 billion people. We have enough out there. Um, I think we need to find a more efficient way to get that food to the people that need it and not make value judgments about you should eat this food versus that food. I mean, people can, with information, can make those decisions on their own. But I don't think, at least for, my, for me personally as a co-author in a book, I don't want to impose that value set on somebody else when they're free to make that decision, what's available to them in their own marketplace. Right. What I'm saying is we, there's enough food to feed everybody, but a billion of us still go hungry. So we have to find a way to get the food that we already produce and grow and get it to the right place for the people that need it without growing our environmental footprint. See, the, here, here, here's what's going to happen. If we don't change the way we think about this issue, we're going to grow more food, to throw more food away, to try to feed more people. The, the UN tells us, is my, there's varying estimates, but I'll pick the center point. The UN says we have to increase our agricultural production by about 100% to feed a planet of 9.6 billion people. That's with today's paradigm. We're just going to grow more and throw more away, proportionally. That 40%, we're just going to continue to throw it away. And I would argue we don't have the land to do it. We already use 38% of our land 
farm. And guess what? All the best land is gone. <laughs> We've been farming for a long, long time. All the best land, land is gone. So now we're down to the less preferable land that we're going to have to double our agriculture production. So that creates its own issues. We clearly don't have enough water. Use 70% of all of our water to grow our food. You only have to look at the headlines in California to recognize we don't have enough water to double the agriculture production of California. So we don't have enough land. We don't have enough water. And I would argue we don't have the environmental license to do this from a greenhouse gas standpoint. So if we don't change our paradigm, we're just going to continue in this cycle of inefficiency, which is where I think we can break this cycle and do something different about it that will have a profound environmental impact it will have an equally profound impact of feeding more people. There is an alternative to growing food out of the land of processing. If you change much of a movement, particularly in the industrial center, the potential for food processing. I, I personally have not, and we didn't come across it in the book. I can speculate that that's even a higher level of investment that. The early, if you have limited capital to do something about your food, I think it would probably be more cost effective to find a way, how do I get it from point A to point B to point C without it spoiling? To, to then layer on top of that that we have to invest in a technology to process it, I think is a, is a next level. We, we do that very well in the developed world. Um, I think it's a staged evolution in developing countries. I don't think food processing starts at this level, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle in the in the progression of an economy. So what is the most cost effective thing that whole chain would do it right now to get to get rid of carbon footprints? I mean, what would be the most cost efficient? Uh, no doubt in a country like um, India or China, truck trailer refrigeration, the ability to get produce from the farm to the market, you don't have to go in an ocean, um, is the best way to do it. It's actually thinking, we're, we're, at, we're, we're thinking about it differently ourselves and how we can reverse engineer our own products, right? So we make very, very sophisticated truck trailer refrigeration systems. A lot of the technology developed just down the road here. So, you know, in one cargo, you can cool to three different temperature points, carry three different types of food, frozen food, fresh food, different types. What we realize is you can't take that technology and drop it on the streets of an emerging economy and think it's going to work. First, they literally may not have streets. Right? So you can't take a big truck in some areas where the infrastructure development uh, won't accommodate it. Um, secondly, th those systems are very, very high in technology and the support structure is probably not there to support the technology over its longevity, over its life. And lastly, it's just not going to be affordable in the emerging e uh, economy. So we're thinking about it differently, saying, okay, how can we actually strip out technology and provide a system that's very high quality, very effective, but low cost? And we've started in India with that, with a system we call City Fresh, which is exactly what we've done. What we've talked about is meant to replace the farmer who's transporting tomatoes in the back of an open pickup truck 100 miles in 100 degree heat saying, no, there's a better way to do it, transport it in a small enclosed truck with this small refrigeration system, which is less expensive than the traditional ones, but only does one thing. It cools your cargo to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. One thing. That is the sweet spot where you can save most fruits and vegetables and extend their life. That's how we're thinking about it, is to say, how can we do it um, less less costly, same effectiveness, same high quality. And now we're even challenging ourselves to say, how can we go even further and kind of rip up those designs and start some out-of-the-box thinking to get really cost-effective, inexpensive systems that can do the job where we need it done most. So we're not done thinking about it. Sure. Okay, one in the back. Yeah, so the question is, do um, supermarkets do a good job of getting local produce versus produce from other parts of the world and around the planet? I think more and more are. Um, you know, 
if you make food in a region, you should eat food in a region. It just makes common sense. Um, but I used to live in Syracuse, and the growing season here is how long? <laughs> it's pretty short. So um, for us to eat locally in Syracuse, we could probably do it really well in July, August, and September. We're not going to do it so well in January, February, and March. So eating locally, absolutely, but there is a limit to that to, su to sustain a society. And so like it or not, we live in a world where we move food everywhere. Who had a banana today? Americans are in love with bananas. We eat more bananas than any other fruit. We eat twice as many bananas as we eat apples. Is there a banana tree in Syracuse? <laughs> Is there a banana tree in the U.S., as Ed asked? No, so, so bananas are the number one cargo that our technologies carry from a marine container refrigeration standpoint. Um, so we move bananas. Um, it's a high source of potassium. It's a high source of vitamins and minerals for us. It's like that for other fruits. And so we need to eat local, but if we want to sustain the diets that we now have, we have to think about how do we get food from point A to point B with the lowest carbon footprint. And by the way, while we're doing that, we're supporting farmers in those communities um, in whether it's South America or wherever we're going to get our bananas. Um, we're supporting those economies and those farmers who are relying on it. I wish we could do more in India where they produce 28% of the world's bananas. They grow 28% of the world's bananas, but they're only exporting 0.3%. Uh, we could be doing a lot more. I'm curious to what inspired you to work on this research and how has it been affected? So the question is, what, what inspired us to embark on the research and how has it um, impacted me effectively? Start with a conversation that Mr. Shaw and I had in the back about what's the higher value of what we do at Carrier with our refrigeration system. So we make these boxes that make bigger boxes cold. And we do it better than anybody else. But is that really what we do? No. We preserve and extend the world's food supply. That's what these little boxes in these big boxes do. They carry a precious commodity that we need in our world, which is our food. So we started to think about, okay, what's the higher purpose of what we do? What's the way that we uh, approach this issue from a hunger standpoint? Then we started to understand the climate implications. And that was an eye-opener and a revelation because the UN, all this data I showed you is UN data from a fantastic report they did about two years ago now on the environmental footprint of food waste. And they produced this fantastic report, and it went nowhere. And so once we stumbled on that, we realized that there was a broader story that had to be told about how food waste, which everybody understands and sees, is at a consequence and at a level that is impacting climate change and impacting our ability to feed the world. And that if we thought about it differently, we could change the way we approach our food. That was the motivation for doing the book. Personally, um, I do a lot of the grocery shopping in my family. My wife is in the back. Um, it's changed the way I go into a grocery store. I used to shop with my eyes, like most people do. You go down the aisle, that looks great. I'll pull this, I'll pull that, I'll pull that. And then you travel, you don't have a plan, you go out to dinner with friends, and you throw it away. So when I look, when I go into uh, a grocery store, I shop with a plan. If I don't have a plan to use it, I don't buy it. If I know I'm not going to use it, or I don't have a plan or a recipe, whatever I'm going to do, I don't buy it. So that's changed my own shopping behavior. Um, we drive our kids nuts about it, but I think they're starting to understand it too and how we can't just waste food. And so it starts at an individual level. Issues like this can be solved by individuals, by governments, and by international organizations working together. We all have the role we can play. So that's a great way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Congress is not trying to attack the subsidized effect of grant opportunities um, outside the initial recession. So we can all be free and, and carry on the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.